Okay, so thank you all for uh, sticking around the whole day. Um, and thank you for participating. It's been a wonderful day. And uh, we're happy to say we had a strong role in it. And um, show of hands, how many people had the chance to get out front to the uh, UTSA students and take a look at their work? Wonderful work, right? How about a round of applause for them? Thank you. So actually, I want to read uh, each of their names off, and, and uh, then we can give them another round of applause as a thank you uh, for the downtown group, Sarah Esserly, Gilbert Morales, Nicholas Post, and Renee Zamora. Could you stand up? And for the Five Points group, Kristen Ramirez, Carla Burrell, like Kristen Flores, and Ryan Kirby. And for the Gardendale group, that was Kimberly Hopkins, Betsida Paulette, and Nicole Thompson. And so you guys can keep standing because uh, the conference has selected you as the winners. So if you, uh, if you want to, um, if you want to uh, come around, and uh, one of the gifts uh, we'd like to give is a copy of, autographed copy of Chuck's uh, book, Thoughts on Building Strong Towns. Well, good afternoon. And wasn't that delightful? I am delighted to see students and young people really being in the right place for the future of San Antonio. My name is Bilad Oates, and I'm delighted to be here this afternoon with you uh, to share this wonderful, wonderful panel. It's called the final panel, but it's really the best panel. So thank you for hanging around. Uh, we've heard so much today that's exciting. And, and, you know, one of the questions that I heard David ask Mr. Bigelow Perry, uh, our last presenter, was, how do residents know about this? What can we do? Well, guess what? Awareness. You know, conferences like today make a difference. And I really want to commend Metro Health uh, for hosting this public health in the built environment. And a special shout out to David Clear for an outstanding, outstanding. <laughs> Our panelists today require no introduction because they've been our keynote speakers, our focus group, our, our uh, a plenary speaker presenters, a moderator, uh, our host, Dr. Uh, Thomas Schlenker. Um, the only one that has not been introduced uh, is uh, Dr. Richard Tangum, and I, I'd like to say a little bit about him. Uh, he's the director of the Center for Urban and Regional Planning Research at the University of Texas at San Antonio. He is uh, a registered architect and urban and regional planner with more than 40 years extensive and varied experience in architecture, urban and regional planning, housing, urban design, and economic development. And we're very pleased to be here at UTSA uh, for this conference. Um, all of our speakers here have contributed so much. But as a final discussion, we'd like to frame this in a concept that's called the social determinants of health because that seems to weave and integrate silos into a way that we can understand and explain health disparities based on all the things that we've learned today. Uh, Robert Wood Johnson, and in partnership with the Wisconsin School of Public Health, uh, has been really activating this model of social de determinants of health because they weren't the ones that really started it. It was something that was developed for the World Health Organization in order to explain health disparities. But Robert Wood Johnson and the Wisconsin Pol School of Public Health have done an excellent job of applying it to improve communities and community health. And they tell us something that we know intuitively and that we heard today from our presenters in many, many, many ways. For example, air quality, water quality, and the built environment account for about 10% of the influence on health outcomes. And socioeconomic factors such as education, income, social disruption account for about 40% of health outcomes, good or bad. 
Human behaviors such as tobacco use, diet and exercise, alcohol use, high risk sexual behavior and violence account for between 30 and 40 percent of health outcomes and only 10 to 20 percent is attributed to health care, which we often think of as the one that we talk about when we talk about health outcomes. And only about 10 to 20 percent is attributed to health care, which the model identifies as access to care and the quality of care. So from a social determinant perspective, recently the Wisconsin School, uh, School of Public Health with uh, Robert Wood Johnson released the county health rankings and um, Bear County was ranked 69th out of 239 counties in the state of Texas. And that was an overall improvement from the 2010 uh, rank of 78th. Um, so that's very good for us in this, in this last 2014 release. Bear County score for the physical environment improved dramatically. And I think we know why. We've heard about what has gone on in San Antonio in these last couple of years. The clinical care ranking also improved as, as did our overall morbidity ranking. So given that we understand the social determinant model very naturally, because, you know, when Ivy Taylor started the afternoon proceedings, she hinted at saying that there was a difference between zip codes and people's longevity actually was different if you lived in this zip code or that zip code. And why? Because of the, the framework that I just talked about. These things can make a difference. Where you live does make a difference. So given that information that I've shared with, uh, with you on what factors play important roles um, in impacting health, Along with the perspectives and ideas that we've heard today, I would like to ask you, the panelists, can you identify one significant way in which San Antonio can continue to improve its health outcomes through the built environment? And so let's begin with Dr. Thomas Schlenker. And you know, I'm going to ask you, each panelist will have about five minutes to respond to the question, and um, then we're gonna have time to hear from you but I'm going to ask if everyone will remain seated because it'll take a long time for people to come back up and forth to the podium. So if we begin with Dr. Uh, Schlinker, uh, then um, we can go uh, down the row and hear from everyone. Oh, thank you, Pilar. Began, uh, glad to, to begin the discussion um, that, you know, this has been a long day, uh, uh, but such a, an exciting and stimulating day. There have just been, we've all been bombarded with great ideas and concepts and visuals and um, it, it, uh, it's almost overwhelming, it's too much. And, and uh, but it helps to be in this kind of setting where, where we are. Um, and I, I do want to thank uh, UTSA uh, for uh, hosting this in, in their, their beautiful downtown campus because uh, just being here is so conducive to the project that we're all about. We, uh, we have this beautiful indoor space that's open and conducive to talking and looking at um, posters and projects and works of art. We have the beautiful outdoor space where most of us had lunch today on the benches, talking with each other. I noticed walking down the hall that uh, they have fabulous staircases in this building. They're the kind of staircases that invite you to walk up them and down them. They're not hidden in some corner. Uh, and, uh, and so I did. I walked up to the library and walked through the library and the library looks out on the inner courtyard where we all had lunch. So it's, it's an integrated kind of uh, urban setting that is, is perfect for us and I'm hoping this kind of uh, relationship continues between uh, various city departments and Metro Health, UTSA, and then the designers and the builders and the architects that are creating uh, our city, recreating our city as I speak, as as we speak about it. Um, I, I think that uh, one thing that I remember from today, um, 
even though all the presentations were absolutely fabulous um, some of the best things I got were between presentations out in the lobby talking to people and one thing that John Dugan the San Antonio City Planner uh, said to me is that he thinks it, it's all about um, connecting connecting the various great ideas that we all have that come from distant, different disciplines, connecting the concept of clean air, clean water, uh, inviting physical space for physical activity, good nutrition, um, economic development, and social justice, uh, an all-inclusive kind of uh, community. Yeah, the challenge is, is not having a good idea because there are a million of them sitting in this auditorium it's connecting them together in a way that creates the community that uh, we all want to live in. And for me, uh, uh, a very good example and, and a great symbol of that here in San Antonio uh, was presented by one of uh, my favorite people who live here, and his name is Dante Jones. And you might have noticed him because he was dressed in orange, as he always is because he leads a bicycle group called Dante's Role Models that takes children and families uh, on bicycle tours starting in their neighborhoods but then going anywhere and everywhere in San Antonio and uh, opening up uh, new vistas to them, new ways of thinking and new parts of town that they would have never seen any other way uh, except in this uh, terrific um, collective uh, physical activity of riding their bikes together, following this orange clad figure with a boom box playing great jazz and, and uh, rhythm and blues on a little trailer behind his bike. And to me that's sort of a, a physical connectivity that connects one neighborhood with another neighborhood and brings people uh, into new areas uh, where they can explore and get new ideas that symbolizes creative uh, connectivity in general that the challenge that we all face to have our ideas converge and to result in connected development that will serve us all Thank you so much, Dr. Schlenker, and if I can answer for you as well, one of the things, most significant things that you can do for next year is please host this conference again. <laughs> I think it's been extraordinary. Um, can I ask John Zimmerman to uh, please uh, give us his perspective on the most significant things San Antonio can do to move forward? Yes, um, thank you very much. Uh, one of the great things that uh, I love to do when uh, coming into a city is take a, a few extra days to explore. And as you could probably tell, um, I do it by bicycle. So I did have a couple of, uh, of days to, to explore and really get a sense as to um, what's happening on the ground. And I want to really commend and applaud um, all of you, the city of San Antonio, you're, you're making inroads, you're making strides in um, addressing the the challenges that you have, you're, you, it's no big surprise. Your your built environment is uh, is a challenge, um, but you're not alone. You're you're right there with the rest of the United States. When you look at the social determinants of health, and you look at the communities that are underserved, and you you've got issues and challenges there, um, the three P's um, that that come out are. Uh, the pathways, your proximity, and programming. So starting with programming, uh, so glad to hear the story of Dante's uh, group and, 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 and that aspect of integrating fun, integrating exploration, and taking it to the, the level of the community and exploring in their neighborhoods and then expanding beyond the neighborhoods and um, making what could seem to be quite scary, like riding your bike from the airport to downtown. Uh, it's a little less scary. Crazy. <laughs> <laughs> it's a little <laughs> it's, it, Hey, this, this was a piece of cake compared to Los Angeles to Long Beach. I mean, um, 
But in all seriousness, um, <laughs> it should be fun. We should be able to laugh a little bit and have a good time and, and play the boom box as we're, we're going through the neighborhoods and be able to see the potential that's there. So there's a fourth P, the potential. And your potential is very, um, very encouraging of what you have out there. So when I look at the pathways and the connectivity to these neighborhoods, again, I had it up on one of my slides where I said accessibility equates to the, the equality that we're looking to, to create. So um, when I was heading uh, on my trip down to the missions and I'm using the bike path down there, I'm taking note of what are the, what are the neighborhoods like? And so we're going, I'm going through um, neighborhoods that uh, you know, are clearly underserved, um, a, f a couple of uh, trailer parks and, and some other things. The fact that they now have an easy way to be able to get activity into their lives and, very critical here, be able to use physical activity to get downtown. Absolutely amazing. And then the, the next, that second uh, P that I mentioned was proximity. And that's when we, we start taking a look at, you know, taking note and taking um, accounting of the activity assets that you have in addition to the pathways and the connections to those pathways. What about access to other open space, other parks, um, other community programs, things of that nature, and really starting to address you know, with those three things, you know, the connectivity through the pathways, the programming with the outreach, and then the proximity to, to the other uh, assets in the built environment. Absolutely critical. I applaud uh, the, the great uh, strides that San Antonio is making and keep up the good work. Thank you. Thank you so much. Pathways, proximity, and programming. So, um, Chuck. What would you say is the most significant way uh, skip right can continue to improve? Um, well, I, I think, you know, to me, I, I think the conversation has to get down to the, the individual level and the block level. Uh, we can have great policies if, if they're not broadly embraced by people. Uh, they're not going to amount to as much. And so to me, like for all of you in the room right now, I've got just a few things that I would recommend you do. First go home and make it a point over the next week to meet your neighbors. I don't know how many of you like know your neighbors well, or how many of you have never met your neighbors, the people who live like directly around you, the people on your block, the people in your neighborhood. I, th I think that we all have a responsibility to meet and know our neighbors. And not just, you know, I, I'm not saying get up in their business or anything or, or invite them into your house. But I'm saying, you know, you should know their names. You should uh, know a little bit about them. You should chat with them. These are the people that you need in your life. These are the passive people that can, you know, let the UPS guy in and, uh, you know, watch your kid for the five minutes that you've got to run and do something. Uh, these are like the very base social bonds that we've kind of let go. It's so easy to, you know, get in the car, drive out the garage, hit the garage door opener, you know, do the reverse on the way home and just never meet your neighbors. And I think we all uh, could benefit from doing that. Beyond that, um, there's just some certain base things that I think we can do to start to get in, in touch with the communities that we live in. And we can model this behavior, as John said earlier, for others. Go for a walk. Go for a bike ride. You know, I, I walked here from the hotel today, uh, which is like two and a half blocks away, what a despotic environment. Uh, I can't imagine any of you walking that on a routine basis and being okay with it, right? I think we have to intentionally engage with the spaces around us uh, because right now we passively engage with them uh, from you know, the back of the steering wheel. And if we wanna know them and understand them intimately, we have to actively engage them, we have to be present. And then the last thing that I would say, I've got a book recommendation for you. Uh, there's a book called The Lean Startup, very popular book in the business world. But the principles that I think are most important uh, apply really well to this because the central tenet of the book is to ask the question, what is the next smallest step we can take to get us moving towards success? What's the next smallest thing we can do 
uh, to bring us closer to our goal. A lot of times we're paralyzed because we look at the problems that face us and they look just insurmountable. We have to change the ordinances. We have to change the streets. We need a new engineer. We need, you know, uh, a different business community. We start to list off like all the things that are wrong and all the things that we think need change and they're so huge and they're so fundamental. Forget about it, forget about it. If everybody in this room just concentrates on like, what is the next smallest step I can take to make the place that I live and the place around me a little bit better, it would be game changing for this city. So the Lean Startup, I would read it, uh, embrace the concepts and see what you can do to apply them in your place. Uh, we have a saying at Strong Towns, which is keep doing what you can to build a strong town. And the idea there is that uh, you know, not all of us will be president, not all of us will be mayor, not all of us want to be in positions of power, but all of us have the capacity to do that next smallest thing to move the ball ahead, and that's what you need to do. Thank you so much, and that, that's really huge. And it seems like the next small thing was to meet your neighbor. Wow, that seems like something <laughs> that we really need to do. That's, that's, pretty, that's, uh, that's pretty easy <laughs> to do. We're not, it's not a huge bar, but it, we'd all benefit from but it. We would all benefit from it. Uh, Doug, how would you answer that question for San Antonio to move this community forward? Well, first, I'd just like to say I thought I was the eye candy in the group when you passed over me, and, and so <laughs> I'm glad that, no you came, that you came back around. Um, <laughs> no, actually, I had you listed here in order of how I was calling you, so it was not discriminatory. <laughs> uh, well, I'm the, the, the city's new uh, chief sustainability officer, and the, the link between sustainability and um, the built environment and, and healthy communities um, is, is, is very clear. Um, I'm also, since I'm the new guy in town, I can still sort of play dumb a little that I'm still learning the ropes. But you know, the time that I've, I've been here, I definitely see, it almost seems like there's, there's multiple San Antonios. There's, there's, there's two, you know, at least two that I'd like to talk about. We have the inner core, we have our inner city neighborhoods where there's high poverty, there's high crime, um, there's uh, significant health problems. Um, and then we have the sprawling communities um, outside um, the, the loops which have different um, issues. Um, and they both require different interventions. I think with the inner city neighborhoods, you know, we really need to sort of take a look at policy, um, how we um, uh, implement infrastructure projects. We need to start creating places in those communities once again. We need to um, start um, uh, revitalizing them using mixed income, um, uh, mixed use neighborhoods, um, better access to uh, education and jobs. And again, it really is about connections, re-knitting those neighborhoods back in with the rest of the city. Uh, in terms of the suburban areas, you know, there's a there's a saying in the planning field that's it's the land use stupid. It's just how we're we're building these communities. They're um, single use pods. It's the land use stupid or the stupid land use. It's the stupid land use. Yeah. It's the land use stupid. It's and so we have uh, your residential pod, your your um, uh, institutional pod. You can't go anywhere without a, a car. And so there's there's two things I think we can do. One is really look at how we're growing going forward, um, taking a look at policies, zoning codes, uh, build more complete neighborhoods, and then for existing um, suburban neighborhoods, really looking at things like um, sprawl repair, how can we start rebuilding communities within these existing sprawled neighborhoods to allow for uh, town centers to, to grow, to allow for um, safe trips by bike or car to, to shops, to schools, and um, just incrementally trying to, to repair what we built. Well, thank you, Doug. Um, he reminds us that we have multiple communities here in San Antonio, multiple San Antonios, and we need to re-knit them. And I, I like that word. Um, Dr. Tangum, um, what do you uh, propose would be the most significant thing we could do for I get San Antonio? Uh, well, I'm the old guy. <laughs> I am born in San Antonio and went to school here. And so I, I bring a, a different kind of perspective of having seen the uh, city really uh, being radically transformed uh, in, in really in the last 60 years. And I think the most critical challenge that this city faces, and which most American cities are facing, is how to deal with the rapid change that's coming. Uh, demographically, uh, by 2060, the city uh, our state demographers telling us and others too that uh, the population could double 
in size. So we could go from over 1.3 million to two plus who knows how many uh, people. Now, the, the real impact is I look at San Antonio in an earlier point in time. Uh, back in 1940, uh, right before 1940, the city limits were 36 square miles, okay? And you had a little over 250,000 people. And so the population density at that time is about 7,000 people per square mile. Um, now today, uh, we have, I have to write it down so I make sure I got my figures right. We have 473 square miles, but John is, uh, Dugan is annexing additional portions. I'm not sure if my figure is correct. But basically our density then has dropped to 2,923 people per square mile. Now, this is telling in many ways. When I go back to San Antonio in 1940, uh, I got a, a glimpse of it as a small boy. It was, a, uh, we were looking at really walkable, complete neighborhoods at that time. Uh, up until 1933, San Antonio had a great trolley system that had 90 miles of track that connected all sections of the city so you could easily get around anywhere. Uh, and, and if you lived in a neighborhood, you really didn't need a car. You basically could walk to a market. All the uh, school children walked to school. Uh, you could walk to a pharmacy. Uh, food was grown in truck gardens around the city. There were uh, uh, fruit and vegetable vendors that passed through the neighborhoods that had circuits. So we were eating well, we were healthier. And in that 60 years, there's been a major transformation. Uh, we've lost our connectivity with each other. In fact, if any of you have read the article by Richard Florida in Atlantic Cities, uh, San Antonio now ranks number one in terms of being America's most income segregated. segregated large metro area in the United wow. States. So we have, a point I'm trying to make, I'm not trying to uh, prick the balloon here, but we've got some major problems we need to tackle. And if we don't basically start dealing with the kinds of development patterns we have today, by 2060, that land area that we're looking at, if we continue the sprawl pattern, could be over a thousand square miles, essentially. So there's the challenge. We really, if we want a healthy city, we're going to have to really get serious about making the city more compact, more efficient, and pay attention to our uh, uh, network and system of moving people about in a more humane way that's equitable to all age groups. Wow, that's a very provocative uh, response. Uh, we're looking at rapid change, rapid growth, population density, but I think one thing to note is the discussion that where we were many years ago and what we've become and where we need to go sounds like a similar place. It's your turn now. Uh, what questions do you have of the panel? Could I, before you sure. can, I, can I make one quick comment? Just about, in regards to growth, I think it's interesting because one of the comments that I've heard today in chatting with people out in the hall, et cetera, was, you know, we're, we're going to have all this growth. And it's almost like, well, the growth is our savior, right? We can make some mistakes and the growth will just cover it up. I mean, we talked about the illusion of wealth beginning this morning. I think it's important to note, you know, the, the path that you're on does not seem to be Detroit's path where you had this huge, you know, population contraction uh, in this large area with, you know, not enough people. Uh, but San Bernardino, California, went bankrupt, this, you know, shortly, uh, you know, a little bit before Detroit did. San Bernardino, uh, over the last two decades, had a 420% population increase. Uh, There's huge, huge amounts of growth. The, the question is not about growth. It's exactly as it was framed down there. It's about how do we build this place productively? I also think that, you know, the, the challenge that you have demographically is that uh, the growth that you're going to have is not the growth that San Bernardino had, which tended to be uh, slightly upper middle class, people who were moving to the city with some affluence. Uh, your demographics are going to be, you know, have much broader uh, range than what the narrow band that they had there. I don't think that that's a, a bad thing. I think that that's actually a really good thing, but it means that you're policies and your approach have to change because segregating people into different pods by income is a really, really destructive way to build a city. My question is about mass transit and the limits that we have uh, in our ability to expand mass transit right now. Um, I 
San Antonio is growing, and I don't know how we can possibly become a healthy city without expanding our mass transit options, our, our public transportation system. And I'm distressed by um, the political opposition that's on the horizon, um, some of it from groups that are not staked in San Antonio, and they're for reasons that don't have anything to do with San Antonio's health um, and well-being as a city. Um, and I'm just wondering, especially for those of you that have experience with other cities, of what, what how do you handle this? Um, how, what are your thoughts about the role of mass transit in a sustainable and healthy city, and what we can do with this tide that's coming? Um, and VIA has a, an argument to make, and they've got, um, there's a lot at stake. And I'm just curious what your take is on that. Oh, do you want to do you want to stay away from that one? <laughs> no, no, I'm, I'm new here. I'm not familiar. With that. <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll let the activity guy jump in on this okay. one. Um, so what I'm going to do is is relate this back to um, a situation that I'm very familiar with because I use mass transit um, continuously when I'm in Boulder. Um, I am car free in Boulder. Uh, so if I'm not on my little folding bike um, or one of my other bicycles that I have, um, I am actually taking uh, public transit. So um, the bus system in Boulder is fantastic. If you've not had a chance to, to study it or understand uh, a little bit about what it's like to have a hip happening bus system, transit system, this is it. It serves all income levels. <laughs> Uh, and, and it's and it's one of these vibrant. It's really it's a really neat thing to be able to um, interface with a transit system where you are able to you know permeate into all the different income levels. And the reason it's able to do so is because it is effective. They've got good routes, good timing schedules. They've really approached it scientifically so that it is convenient. Um, and guess what? I get an awful lot of walking in to be able to, uh, you know, get to, to mass transit and be able to, uh, you know, be able to take advantage of that, you know, comprehensive uh, route system that it has. Uh, when I was uh, attending the uh, conference for Smart Growth and New Partners uh, conference down in Denver, yep. I was able to ride the RTD from Boulder all the way down to Denver on an express bus. So if you want to have an impact on being able to have transit work in a more suburbanized slash urban interface, you're going to have to be able to make it significant. Um, and it's got to be a program that works and the money's got to pencil out, um, but you can't just do, you know, kind of do transit. Uh, another great uh, system that I'm familiar with is in Honolulu that has one of the most vibrant bus systems. Um, and yes, I can't forget about light rail and, and the fact that, you know, that's one of the things that in Denver, um, you know, they're being quite aggressive with trying to, uh, you know, get the, the lines in place uh, throughout Denver. But quite frankly, you know, light rail is extremely expensive, so you may have uh, a interface that takes place between the bus and uh, any light rail uh, lines that you have that are spurs. So that's, you know, from my perspective, Laura, I hope that helps a, a little bit. Um, really, the, the key successes, again, are it's the, the number of stops, the routes, and the fact that it is considered cool to ride the bus. I'm frequently on the bus with high schoolers uh, getting around uh, throughout town. So that to me is significant, that it's, it's not something where just the poor people are riding. I thought you were going to say earlier that you rode your bike from the Denver airport into downtown Denver. That would have, that would have been incredible. Um, I, I, I think that there's a couple things on transit that are really, really important. And, and I get the transit people upset with me sometimes because of the same, you know, reaction to build it and they will come transit as I have to build it and they will come other things. There's, there's a sense today amongst many that transit is the, the solution, the magic bullet. And I'm not suggesting you were suggesting that. But I, I want to make it clear that, especially here in San Antonio, um, 
we need to walk before we run. And literally, I'm saying we need to be able to walk. Uh, I was out, you know, walking your streets and you've got bus stops all over the place that you can't even get to, right? Like, how do you get to the bus stop? What sense is there in putting in, you know, an expensive, expansive system when like literally you just need to paint some crosswalks and fix some curb radiuses and narrow up some lanes? I mean, we're talking about pennies instead of, you know, you know, tens of dollars uh, in comparison of what like needs to be done to get that first step. Uh, it's really hard to impose a transit culture on a community that doesn't have respect for you know the current systems that it has or you know a biking culture or a walking culture to me there's a certain progression that we need to start with the other thing that i think is really important and this goes to how we finance transit and how we make it viable over time if you want transit you have to have a place remember when we talked about strodes the difference between a road and a street Great transit connects productive places. It functions like a road. It gets you from one productive place to another productive place. So if you want functional, viable transit, build productive places and connect them. That's what like a really viable transit system looks like. A lot of what we do today for transit is we take the mentality of the highway engineer and transfer it over to the transit where we say, well, we're gonna serve a corridor. And what you wind up with is the same low productivity development pattern that doesn't pay for itself. And when we do it with transit, we actually do some type of accounting that we don't do with highways. Build productive places and connect them. So if you're an advocate for transit, by default, you're an advocate for great productive places. And if you put your energies there, the transit will follow. Let me also say that uh, Ah. This is not, thank you. <laughs> that, I'm not running for office or anything. So. <laughs> that it, it hurts a little uh, to, to hear someone from the outside come in and say, your bus stops are horrible. And it's <laughs> the walk from the hotel to the campus is Despotic, really terrible. Yeah. But in fact, it reminds us of the truth. And... Um, I was talking with a UTSA student uh, this morning who put together the five points uh, poster uh, and that's the way I come and go to work every day on my bike and I ride past the bus stop at five points at the intersection of Flores and um, Fredericksburg and it's got to be one of the busiest bus stops in town there is always about 20 people there and it's just ugly and horrible um, and it could be beautiful because it's actually a kind of a vacant corner. There's nothing there except for about three gigantic, beautiful trees that are just being choked by this massive, ugly nothing around it. And it wouldn't take much to make it a decent, inviting place. Uh, the other comment I would make about mass transit in general and how do we get a better mass transit system in San Antonio is I was about 10 years ago the, the director of public health in Salt Lake City and we were having the same argument there and lots of opposition to mass transit in the Salt Lake City area from the usual suspects of people who sell cars and build highways etc. Um, <laughs> and uh, what what and, and I went back there last year to go skiing at Alta and I noticed there is light rail from the airport and there's various um, other amenities that go up, up and down uh, uh, and that were very, very nice, really beautiful done, beautifully done. They had an advantage though in Salt Lake City. They have terrible air quality there because they're right up against the mountains and they have these horrible yeah. inversions. It's kind of like Mexico City. So it, I think it was easier for them to make the case the last thing we need are more cars driving up and down the Wasatch Mountains because we're killing ourselves. We have better air quality here in San Antonio, however, and we're one of the last big cities in the United States to still be in attainment of air quality standards up until now. But we will soon be falling out of attainment to those standards and especially with all the development going on south of us along the Eagle Ford Shale uh, oil development, 
um, it, and and the dub, perhaps doubling of the growth of the population of San Antonio, the writing is on the wall. Um, our air quality is going to be more and more challenged here. And so I think maybe we can use that as sort of the wedge to get this done because uh, we're, we're going to have to or else we're going to have Mexico City quality of air here in the future. Do we have time for more questions? Do I see anybody else? You know, it, you can even take a stab at answering the question yourself. You know, what single most important thing, most significant way in which San Antonio can move forward to continue to improve its health outcomes through the built environment? Maybe you have an idea. Would you like to share it? Anybody out there? want the mic to um, respond to Dr. Schlenker's comment about the five points bus stop. Uh, <laughs> no. <laughs> no, I feel obligated to, to respond. Um, VIA actually has had a design for that site on the boards for no less than three to four years. And part of the issue with bus stops around the city is getting easements from property owners. And in that particular case, having a willing seller for that property has been a a uh, difficult issue and it is um, actually on our agendas you know currently as we speak so we are trying very hard to get that because we do have a design to greatly improve that stop because it is one of our highest ridership stops in the city so you're absolutely right there and along that line um, trying to improve uh, what you asked you know what could we do maybe for the next bond election which is uh, probably going to be in 17 2017 that a grassroots effort to demand improvements in our pedestrian network and how each project is evaluated when it goes to scoping that um, communities, neighborhoods um, look to their political leaders to say that um, what good is a, a large-scale project if nobody can walk. So I would suggest that um, you talk to your council people and look at the different types of projects that are being suggested in your districts for these bond projects and, um, and really demand that that pedestrian network, because we can't have just pockets. I look at it similar to, you know, what if we had just major intersection connections at our freeways, but we didn't have the connection in between the intersections? Where would we be? It's the same thing with the pedestrian network. You know, there's one thing that I'd like to do when we're done here, and this just crossed my mind. When we're done, I'm going to walk off the stage, I'm going to walk out the door, and I'm going to walk out to the street, and whoever wants to join me out there, we'll just talk for like 10 minutes about the street right in front of the university. This is a university, right? Where do, where do you walk more than when you go to a university? You can't walk to the parking lot across the street, right? And I just want to go out and just like show you, because I think sometimes in an environment uh, where really walking is not just an afterthought, but it's a, it's a distant, far, far, you know, thing uh, down the list of priorities. I think sometimes we just forget like all the simple things. And to me, I, I think that even just in front of the school, we could be leaders here in making this block and the block on the other side more walkable if we just like could visualize what a different thing would look like. So when we're done here, uh, I'm gonna walk out the stage, I'm gonna walk out the door, I'm gonna walk out there, and anybody that wants to come with will spend five minutes or 10 minutes just talking about basically urban design 101 on the one block out in front of this place. Oh. I lost my mic, but we're out of time, and I really want to thank this panel for such insightful responses to our question, for their participation today, and all of you. Uh, and so there is no finale until we all do a standing applause for all of you and for this panel. Thank you for coming. Thank you.